talk about why uh, online education uh, works. I first became interested in this uh, actually in 2009 when I gave a uh, TED talk. This 15 minute or so talk, this has now been seen online uh, almost a million times, it's almost a million hits. Now I, I don't hesitate to add, that is not a big number as, as TED talk to go. I am quite far down the, the uh, the leaders of, of, on the TED board are you know, 30 million, 50 million. Nevertheless, this 15 minute talks have seen about a million times. Uh, so that's like, I began to think about this in terms of my career, it's like 250,000 man hours of education time. So I began to do some calculations and basically you can sum up my career as follows. More than 75% of it was teaching this 15 minutes of TED. All the other decades of my teaching, you know, in front of a classroom, uh, 30 students at a time, two hours or three hours at a time, that's like less than a quarter. So what this indicates is the immense leverage which the online education uh, gives us. It's now possible for a single professor to teach more students in an afternoon than was previously possible in a lifetime. And that's really remarkable for a number of reasons. Maybe we can go back to Pythagoras and think about Pythagoras drawing lines in the sand. And up until recently, that's almost exactly what we did in our classrooms. We drew lines on the chalkboard. Slight productivity improvements since then. Pythagoras could teach you know, 10 or 20 at a time. Most of us do about the same. Jose manages to do 500 at a time sometimes a little bit more. But with these technologies, uh, we can increase our leverage by 10, 100, 1,000 times. We even get this across the world. He, at age 15, he was one of only 340 students out of 150,000 to take a online course at Coursera, uh, circuits and electronics. And uh, he earned a perfect score. He got himself into MIT because of that. So we're able to reach many more students, not just traditional students, not just US students, but students in the world who otherwise simply would not have access to education at a high quality level. Now, we're all a little bit more familiar with a picture like this <laughs> than we would like to be. And I don't claim that online education is going to solve this problem, okay? Uh, but there are a number of efficiencies which teaching online uh, produces. And I break these down into time saving, time chunking, and time sh shifting. Let's look at time saving first. So when I'm in a classroom at George Mason, I'm sure this is familiar to you all, and 20% of my students, you know, they're not following something. It's very natural for me to repeat myself. But that's incredibly inefficient. That means that 80% of my students hear something twice, which they only needed to hear once. In the online world, you never need to repeat yourself, and you never should repeat yourself. Because in the online world, the students are in control. The students can decide when they need to rewind, when they need to hear something twice. So this means you can actually teach much more in less time, because you never repeat yourself in the online world. Time chunking. Why do we have classes of 50 minutes or two hours and 50 minutes? This has nothing to do with optimal attention span. It has to do with the fact that you have such a fixed cost of getting to the university in the first place and getting everyone there at the same time that you kind of want to cram as much as possible to reduce those travel costs. What we have found, uh, Tyler Cowan and I, in doing Work <coughs> Revolution University, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, is that breaking ideas down into five minutes to 15 minutes, maybe 18 minutes. So most of our videos at MR University are around five minutes. The longest is about 18 minutes. 
This doesn't mean that you need to dumb the ideas down at all. It simply means you need to break them down into smaller chunks, which fit people's natural attention span, kind of the length of a rock song to a, a TV segment to a TED talk. We don't have to be constrained by the necessity of getting everyone there. Time shifting. This became clear to me um, two years ago, this is several years ago now, when uh, my kids went to grandma's, went to my mother's house uh, for the summer, for summer vacation. And my kids got to the house and uh, they started watching TV and they were like pushing the button and the TV wasn't stopping. <laughs> and they couldn't understand, well, where are our shows? Okay. See, because my kids had grown up their entire lives with TiVo. So to them, the idea that you had to look in like a TV guide <laughs> and figure out, oh, I have to be like in front of the TV at 8 p.m. to watch my show, that was like grandma was living in the 19th century. Uh, she was only living in the 20th century. <laughs> this was crazy. This was flabbergasting, right? And yet, this is exactly what we do in education. You've got to go to the, uh, the, the guide and look at, oh, my class is only available Tuesday, Thursdays, you know, 4 to 5.15, but I got this other class at that time. That's crazy. Uh, what is the evidence? Oh, well, OK, I'm talking about this. What is the evidence for this? There's a number of good studies. The Department of Education did a uh, meta-analysis of a bunch of studies. What they found is that students in online conditions performed at least as well, in fact, modestly better than those learning the same material traditional face-to-face. -face. Uh, hybrid seemed to work best of all, modestly best of all. Um, and the effectiveness of online learning appears to be worked quite well for a bunch of different types of learners and a bunch of different types of students with various levels of uh, uh, ability and so forth. The best study we have is by uh, Bill Bowen, who uh, uh, was president of uh, Princeton. He did a large randomized experiment uh, teaching statistics in an online hybrid version and in a traditional version. And what he found is that students in the online version learned just as much. In fact, they learned a little bit more. So this is like the final exam. The uh, blue is traditional. The orange is hybrid. So hybrid was a little bit better. The post-test slightly better. A pass rate a little bit better. Not statistically significant. Okay. The online model was 36% to 57% less costly to run. And of course, using a traditional lecture format. That means, since the outcomes were the same, there's a productivity improvement of 56 to 133%. So online education trumps the cost disease. That's a huge improvement in productivity. Moreover, this is actually an under and the, excuse me, an underestimate. Because Bowen, those costs, those were the costs to the university. In addition, what he found is that the hybrid students learned just as much in less study time. 25% less study time. And that does not include the savings in time of not having to drive to the university and try to find parking, like we did this morning. <laughs> so there are huge savings, both to the university and to students. So when I say this, uh, uh, you know, people often, well, what about the, the magic of the classroom? Uh, you know, what about that one-on-one -on -one interaction? Isn't that what we really, you know, uh, value? Isn't that great? And you know, they sort of have this image, right? And look, yes, I I love uh, teaching. Uh, I love teaching, uh, having students one-on-one, -on -one, especially you know the the, the really uh, high-quality, enthusiastic students. It's great. Okay, there's definitely something uh, to this. But of course, this is the image, the school of Athens. But the reality, quite often, is this. 
In other words, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. So even if that image is correct in some cases, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, a lot of courses being taught um, by people who may not even be full-time. What we also see is that the politics is pushing in this direction. So everybody is looking for a way to lower the cost of education. Parents are worried about this. Governors are worried about it. The president is worried about it. And online methods are really the uh, <coughs> only credible way we have right now of significantly lowering the cost of education. So I think whether you sort of agree with me or not that uh, these technologies have benefits, the politics towards the $10,000 degree and so forth is pushing in this direction. So this is um, Marjorie Revolution uh, University, or MR University. Uh, this is what my colleague uh, Tyler Cowan and I uh, have put together. Uh, we aim to be the, the Khan Academy of Economics. So that's our goal. Now what makes this a little bit different than Coursera is that all of our videos are available all the time. It's like Khan Academy. Anyone who uh, wants to use some of these videos in their classroom or otherwise uh, can uh, use them free of charge, okay, no problems. And here are like some of the videos. We've got a whole list of them. So these are people in development and economics. Uh, five or ten minutes. What are the major um, uh, what are the major contributions of somebody like Paul Romer or William Easterly or Jeff Sachs or Danny Roderick or Paul Krugman? So another aspect of online education, you know, the old sort of ideal system, the British tutorial model, where you had a one-on-one -on -one person, you know, who would uh, guide you, who would help you, who would uh, lead you along. Of course, this model was uh, destroyed by the cost of disease. It's simply too expensive to have a tutorial model uh, today, except for the very, you know, the very richest, the 1% of the 1%, okay, may be able to afford that. However, what online education does is it substitutes capital for labor, capital in the form of software, in the form of artificial intelligence. So in fact, the tutorial model is coming back, but through AI. And think about an AI tutor. Rapid feedback, 24 hours a day, infinitely patient, massively experienced, able to guide students. In fact, one of the things which online education is going to do is collect a massive amount of data. And that's going to help us tremendously. Because as you know, when students make a mistake, or an exam or something like that, those mistakes are typically not random. There's a structure to them. You can begin to see with experience as a teacher and more as we collect data, okay, why is the student making this particular pattern of error? It's because they're missing this concept. They haven't quite grasped that grasp this idea yet. What an AI tutor will be able to do using these data banks is to look at a student's pattern of error and correct answers and direct them to just that piece of knowledge, just that video, just that concept that that individual student needs to complete their picture. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. What is that one piece of knowledge that this individual particular student needs to complete the puzzle. And with the data, with artificial intelligence, we'll be able to direct them much more easily. Again, improving the productivity of education. <coughs>